In today's economy, cash flow is tight and families are held captive to high interest rate credit card debt. Churchill Mortgage can restructure your current mortgage and significantly reduce these problems. Get a free analysis and learn how to eliminate credit card interest rates, lower bills, and start taking control of your budget. Get started at churchillmortgage.com. This is a paid advertisement. NMLS ID 1591. NMLS Consumer Access Equal Housing Lender 1749 Mallory Lane Suite 100 Brentwood Tennessee 37027. Gear Patrol calls their new dive watch the best sub five hundred dollar dive watch. Full stop. Men's Health rated them as the most stylish solar watch in the game. Who are we talking about? It's movement. They're leveling up your gift giving with the sleekest watches you can buy and the biggest deals of the season. Shop thirty to fifty percent off Movement's innovative California clean watches, jewelry, and accessories with fast free shipping and returns now at MVMT.com. That's MVMT.com. This is Space Time, Series 26, Episode 21, for broadcast on the 17th of February, 2023. Coming up on Space Time, new models explain canyons on Pluto's binary partner, Sharon, discovery of a new main belt asteroid, and a spectacular start to 2023 for SpaceX. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study claims giant 7-kilometre-high ancient chasms draped out along the surface of Pluto's binary partner Sharon are evidence of a once expansive subsurface liquid water ocean. The findings reported in the journal Icarus are based on new modelling to better understand the strange features which were first observed by NASA's New Horizons spacecraft during its historic flyby of the system. New Horizons was launched on January 19, 2006 from the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida aboard an Atlas V rocket. The probe became the first ever spacecraft to visit the binary system of Pluto and Charon on July 14, 2015, when it flew just 12,500 kilometres above the cold Plutonian surface. It also studied Pluto's binary partner Charon and their four moons, Styx, Nix, Kerberos and Hydra. Pluto and Charon form a binary dwarf planetary system. The two bodies orbit around a common centre of gravity, called a Barry Centre, which is located outside the radius of Pluto. They're two of the largest known bodies in the Kuiper Belt, a ring of frozen worlds, comets and icy debris circling the Sun out beyond the orbit of Neptune. When New Horizons swooped past these little understood bodies in the frozen darkness of the outer solar system far away from the sun, scientists were shocked to find geologically active worlds rather than the inert icy orbs previously envisioned. The observations and the implications they suggest have been intriguing scientists ever since. And so scientists have been revisiting the data. One study, the focus of our report, has been looking at the source of cryovolcanism flows and the belt of fractures on Sharon. New models based on this work confirm earlier hypotheses suggesting that Sharon had an internal ocean, which froze and then expanded, forming deep, elongated depressions along its girth. But the models also showed that this was less likely to lead to cryovolcanoes erupting with ice, water and other materials seen in Sharon's northern hemisphere. The study's lead author, Alyssa Roden from the Southwestern Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas, says the combination of geological interpretations and thermal orbital evolution models implies that Sharon had a subsurface liquid ocean that eventually froze. Now, when an internal ocean freezes, it expands, creating large stresses on the icy shell and pressurizing any water below. The authors suspected that this was the source of Sharon's large canyons and cryovolcanic flows. New ice forming on the inner layer of the existing ice shell can also stress the surface structure. To better understand the evolution of the Moon's interior and surface, Rodin and colleagues modelled how fractures formed in Sharon's ice shell as the ocean beneath it froze. The authors modelled oceans of water, ammonia and a mixture between the two. Ammonia can act as an antifreeze, prolonging the life of an ocean. However, the overall results didn't substantially differ. 
When fractures penetrate the entire ice shell and tap the subsurface ocean, the liquid, pressurised by the increase in volume of the newly frozen ice, can be pushed through those fractures to erupt onto the surface. So, the models sought to identify the conditions that could create fractures that fully penetrate Charon's ice shell, thereby linking its surface and subsurface water to allow ocean source cryovolcanism to occur. Problem is, based on the models they have of Sharon's interior and evolution, the ice shells were simply too thick to fully be cracked by stresses associated with ocean freezing. Because the synchronous and circular orbits of Pluto and Sharon stabilised relatively early, tidal heating only could have occurred during the first million years of the solar system's existence. Roden says either Sharon's ice shells were less than 10 kilometres thick when the flows occurred, as opposed to the more than 100 kilometres indicated today, or the surface was not in direct communication with the ocean as part of the eruptive process. If Sharon's ice shell had been thin enough to be fully cracked, it would imply substantially more ocean freezing than what's been indicated by the canyons identified during New Horizons flyby. While Pluto was discovered by Clyde Tombaugh at the Lyle Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona in 1930, its binary partner Sharon wasn't identified until June the 22nd, 1978. That was by James Christie and Robert Harrington, who were working at the U.S. Naval Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, only about 10 kilometres from where Pluto had been discovered. And the thing is, the astronomers weren't looking for satellites of Pluto. Christie was examining a series of grainy telescope images, trying to refine Pluto's orbit around the Sun. This report from NASA TV tells the story of this amazing scientific discovery. Horizons mission going to the Pluto system, it really is a system. It's a little mini solar system in its own right. We have not only Pluto, we also have a giant moon next to it, Charon. When we first saw Pluto, Clyde Tombaugh first saw it and brought it to the world's attention, it was a mere dot. It stayed a mere dot for a long time. In the 1970s, my stepfather, Jim Christie, kept looking at that dot. I went to Bob Harrington and asked him, if he had some scumpolitic do, and he reaches in his desk and pulls out an envelope from Flagstaff of Pluto. So I took the lights to a microscope, and I started looking at the images. As he was looking at them, he noticed that there was a bump on one of the sides of Pluto. He noticed that this bump seemed to move. When I looked at the two that were a month apart, one had the asymmetry up and the other one had the asymmetry down. He was very surprised. And then after the surprise, he got a little worried. Was he seeing things or was he actually seeing what he thought he saw? By looking at that and factoring that in, he deduced that something must be moving around Pluto and therefore he was able to figure out that there was a satellite. It was there that I realized that Pluto has a moon. Well, I was at work when he called and he said, I think I'm going to be famous. I think I've discovered a moon. Then I went and told Bob Harrington that Pluto has a moon. And Bob said, Jim, you're crazy. And then comes the big waiting game having to get more evidence for that. Jim did the measuring and Bob did the uh, statistics and uh, they paralleled in their answers. He told me that he would try to name the moon after me if he could. And he just had made up the name Charon. Char is what my family call me. And he put the O-N onto the end of it. I'm always thinking about physics, electrons and protons. I added an O N, and I thought I could name a char on. Now, when he came up with that idea, he was a bit worried that maybe he bit off more than he could chew uh, because he was worried about the International Astronomical Union approving something like that. He 
he got up, he was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I, I hope to, I can name it after her, but I'm not sure. So anyway, he went to find the dictionary. And then what happened was one of the strangest events of my life. And so he got the dictionary out and he looked it up and there it was in the dictionary. And it fit because it was within Greek mythology and then it was accepted by the International Astronomical Union uh, as Charon, the boatman that ferried the dead souls across the river Styx. I just feel so proud and like I say, a lot of husbands promise their wives the moon, but he delivered. And she has a big smile on her face when she says that. Three, two, one. We have ignition and liftoff of NASA's New Horizons spacecraft on a decade-long voyage to visit the planet Pluto and then beyond. The whole world saw it for the first time, and all we had seen before was just a little fuzzy blur-like. And to be able to see it, it was just incredible. There's a giant chasm encircling the, the equator of, of Sharon that we think is a, a remnant of a water ice ocean that was under, just underneath its surface in the early days, more than four billion years ago. These are ice cliffs that are about four miles high. That's high for a little moon. That's amazing. It's kind of amazing when you think about it, you know, all that happened over the last 40 years. While you're going from a little blur, which you actually don't see anything, to this enormous detail, it's a shock. <laughs> And in that report from NASA TV, we heard from NASA New Horizons project scientist Hal Weaver from Johns Hopkins University, science teacher Randy Monroe, astronomer Jim Christie from the U.S. Naval Observatory, and his wife Charlene Christie. This is Space Time. Still to come, a new main belt asteroid discovered, and a spectacular start to 2023 for SpaceX. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Okay, time to take a break from our show for a word from our sponsor, NordVPN. You know, in 2023, it really is time to take your internet privacy seriously. And NordVPN is the perfect solution for protecting your data, keeping it safe from malicious actors. With their state-of-the-art encryption technology, NordVPN ensures that your personal data and that of your family remains perfectly secure no matter where in the world you're browsing or streaming content. Plus, with their special birthday deal right now, there's never been a better time to get started with this incredible service. You need to remember when using unsecured public networks, like those found in coffee shops, anyone can access and exploit sensitive information on unprotected devices, including yours. But when you use a mobile VPN, like NordVPN, not only will all your data be encrypted, but also hidden away from prying eyes who may be trying to gain access without permissions. In addition to providing unparalleled security measures for internet users everywhere, they also offer lightning-fast speeds, which make streaming videos or downloading large files effortless tasks, even while connected through public networks. And by signing up today with Nord's special birthday deal, you'll have some big savings on your plan, as well as enjoying additional features, such as a password manager and malware scanning options, all at no extra cost. Plus, because it's NordVPN's birthday, there'll be bonus-free time. It could be three months, it could be a year. It's an entirely random prize draw, but one thing for certain, everyone wins. And of course, all of this comes risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. So, what have you got to lose? Check out all the details by using the space-time URL. Just go to nordvpn.com slash stuartgarry. That URL again is nordvpn.com slash stuartgarry. So don't waste another minute. Invest in yourself by taking advantage of this amazing opportunity before it's too late. Sign up for NordVPN's birthday deal now. 
And of course, the link details are in the show notes and on our website. And now, it's back to our show. You're listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A previously unknown 100 to 200 metre wide asteroid, roughly the size of Rome's Colosseum, has been discovered by astronomers using the James Webb Space Telescope. The authors were examining data from the calibration of the observatory's mid-infrared instrument when they serendipitously detected the interloping asteroid. The object, likely the smallest ever observed by Webb, is in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. More observations will be needed to better characterise the asteroid's nature and properties. Our solar system is teeming with millions of asteroids and small rocky bodies, many of which are yet to be discovered. One of the discoverers of this asteroid, Thomas Mueller from the Max Planck Institute, says this find was completely unexpected. It happened as the astronomers were examining calibration observations targeting the solar system's ecliptic plane. The findings, reported in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics, suggest that many more of these objects are likely to be out there and likely to be detected with this new instrument. The web observations which revealed the small asteroid were not originally designed to hunt for new asteroids. In fact, there were calibration images of the main belt asteroid 10920 1998 BC1, which astronomers discovered in the year 1998. But the calibration team considered them to have failed for technical reasons due to the brightness of the target and an offset telescope pointing. Despite this, the data on the asteroids were used by the team to establish a new test technique in order to constrain an object's orbit and estimate its size. The validity of the method was then demonstrated for asteroid 10920 using the mid-infrared instrument's observations combined with data from ground-based telescopes and from ESA's Gaia mission. And in the course of their analysis of the mid-infrared instrument's data, the team also found a smaller, previously unnoticed asteroid in the same field of view. Mueller says the findings show that even failed web observations can be scientifically useful, that's if you have the right mindset and a bit of luck. He says Webb's incredible sensitivity made it possible to see this roughly 100-metre-wide object at a distance of more than 100 million kilometres. Current models predict the occurrence of asteroids of all sizes. But studying the smaller ones, those under a kilometre in size, is difficult. That's because there's less detail available than on larger asteroids, owing to the difficulty of observing these objects. So... Webb's ability to see these objects will provide astronomers with new insights, providing the necessary data to refine models of the solar system's formation and early history. This is Space Time. Still to come, a spectacular start to 2023 for SpaceX, and later in the science report, a deadly new pathogen killing native Australian frog species. All that and more still to come on Space Time. SpaceX has hit the ground running in 2023 with no less than nine launches in just over a month. The company's first launch for the year took place on January the 3rd when a Falcon 9 rocket carrying 114 spacecraft launching from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Base in Florida with a Transporter 6 ride share mission. That was the 15th launch and landing using the same Falcon 9 core stage booster. Less than a week later, on January the 9th, another Falcon 9 carried a flotilla of one web broadband internet satellites into orbit, also from Pad 40. And the booster also returned safely to Earth. Just two days later, on January the 11th, SpaceX's CRS-26 Dragon cargo ship returned to Earth after 45 days in space, splashing down in the Gulf of Mexico off the Florida coast near Tampa. The spacecraft, which had been docked to the International Space Station, was carrying over a 1,000 kilograms of return scientific experiments and equipment. Then on January the 15th, SpaceX launched its first Falcon Heavy mission of the year, with three Falcon 9 straps side-by-side, carrying the classified US Space Force 67 military mission into orbit from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This was the second launch and landing for the same Falcon Heavy side boosters, which had previously supported the US Space Force 44 mission. The Falcon 9 core stage for this flight was made expendable in order to reach its geosynchronous orbit. 
Just three days later, on January the 18th, SpaceX launched the sixth Lockheed Martin-built Global Positioning System 3 satellite as part of an upgrade to the US Space Force managed constellation. This was the second launch and landing for the same Falcon 9 core stage. And just a day later on the other side of the country, another Falcon 9 carried another 51 Starlink broadband internet satellites into low Earth orbit from Space Launch Complex 4 East at the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. On January the 26th, SpaceX launched another 56 Starlink satellites into orbit from Pad 40 at Cape Canaveral, and it was the ninth launch and landing for the same Falcon 9 booster. On the last day of January, another 49 Starlink satellites, together with a deorbit space tug carrying four satellites, were flown into low Earth orbit from Space Launch Complex 4E at Vandenberg as part of the seventh launch and landing of the same Falcon 9 core stage booster. The deorbit Starfield mission was the eighth commercial flight for their orbital transfer vehicles and the first to a mid inclination orbit. Just two days later, on February the 2nd, another Falcon 9 launched another 53 Starlink satellites into orbit from Pad 39A at Kennedy, which, as well as being the fifth launch and landing for the same booster, also marked the 200th successful flight for a Falcon 9 rocket. And it doesn't end there. Falcon 9 Flight 201 lasted into orbit just four days later on February the 6th, carrying the Hispasat Amazonius Nexus mission from Space Launch Complex 40 with a flight marking the sixth launch and landing of the same booster. The 4,500kg Thales Alenia space-built satellite is equipped with ion propulsion and will provide KU band communications for air and maritime transport. Certainly a busy start to the year. This is Space Time. Gear Patrol calls their new dive watch the best sub $500 dive watch. Full stop. Men's Health rated them as the most stylish solar watch in the game. Who are we talking about? It's movement. They're leveling up your gift giving with the sleekest watches you can buy and the biggest deals of the season. From their innovative ceramic materials to sexy automatic divers, from ultra thin dress watches to solar powered statement pieces and everything in between, movement is making sure you're the good gifter this year for your family, your friends, or for yourself. And now you can take advantage of 30 to 50% off Movement's California clean watches, jewelry, and accessories to get them a gift they'll never forget. With fast free shipping and returns and amazing bang for your buck, Movement makes for a relaxed shopping experience. And with one-size-fits-all watches, it's an easy, elegant gifting experience too. Shop 30 to 50% off now at MVMT.com. That's MVMT. Com. The holidays start here at Baker's with a variety of options to celebrate traditions old and new. You could do a classic herb roasted turkey or spice it up and make turkey tacos. Serve up a go-to shrimp cocktail or use Simple Truth wild caught shrimp for your first Cajun risotto. Make creamy mac and cheese or a spinach artichoke fondue from our selection of Murray's cheese. No matter how you shop, Baker's has all the freshest ingredients to embrace all your holiday traditions. Baker's, fresh for everyone. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making use in science this week with the Science Report. A new study shows that vaccines designed specifically to target both the original COVID-19 variant and the Omicron BA4, BA5 strains may not be any more effective than the original boosters using the original mRNA vaccines. The findings, reported in the New England Journal of Medicine, compared a small group of people who had three or four doses of the original vaccines. Three original vaccine doses followed by an Omicron-specific bivalent vaccine and people who had a breakthrough Omicron BA4 or BA5 infection after receiving three or four original vaccine doses. After testing the participants' blood against multiple COVID-19 variants, the researchers found that the strongest antibody response came from the breakthrough infection group and the weakest from the three-dose group. But there were no significant differences between the original four-dose group and those who had been given the Omicron-specific booster. Over 6.8 million people have now been killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus since it was first detected near the Wuhan Institute of Virology in September 2019. 
The World Health Organization estimates the true death toll to be likely to be around 16 million, with some 672 million confirmed cases globally. New technologies upended science's understanding of how they see sea level rise around the world as the planet warms. Current models of sea level rise suggest that most widespread impacts will occur after sea levels have risen by at least several metres. However, new laser imaging technology aboard the latest generation of NASA satellites shows that scientists have overestimated the height of coastal areas. That's because they were previously using radar technology unable to fully penetrate vegetation. Now, a report in the journal Earth's Future claims the biggest increases in sea level rise inundation will cover twice as much area as previously estimated. Scientists are studying a new deadly pathogen that's decimating native Australian frog populations. A report in the journal Functional Ecology says the research by teams from the University of Western Sydney has been exploring the lethal fungal pathogen causing widespread bacterial disruption. The researchers are assessing how responses differ by different species across the globe. The findings suggest that if the pathogen load is low, the host may only experience skin disruption and changes to the immune system. But if the pathogen dose is high enough, they'll experience changes in reproduction and body condition, ultimately leading to death. If last year's soccer, sorry, football World Cup has proved anything, it's proved that most psychics, be they human or animal, tend to get it wrong. And the thing is, when you have a match where there are just two teams playing each other, even if you know nothing about the game, you still have at least a 50-50 chance of picking a winner, right? But a careful tabulation of predictions of some of the world's best-known psychics showed that they tended to be wrong far more times than what they were right. Interestingly, the animals actually did better than their human psychic counterparts, successfully picking just under half of all winners. That compares to human psychics, who must have been on the wrong celestial wavelength. They were successful at picking just a third of match winners. One allegedly time-travelling human psychic predicted Brazil would be the world champions, but he must have been aboard the wrong TARDIS. Meanwhile, Anthony Carr, who describes himself as the modern-day Nostradamus, predicted England would win. He should have listened to Nicholas the Dolphin, who successfully predicted Argentina would win the World Cup. And he wasn't the only one. A pair of giant pandas correctly predicted the winners of 11 out of the 24 matches. Although when you think about it, that still means they got more than half of their picks wrong. In the lead-up matches, Alfie the Alpaca predicted England would lose to Iran. England won 6-2. He then did a complete about-face, predicting England to beat France. They lost. The psychic seal Banana also predicted England to win and lost. Chao Boy the Lion predicted that France would be the only European country to reach the Final Four. Of course, he was wrong. Croatia also qualified. And he predicted the four would include Brazil. Wrong again. They lost in the quarterfinals. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says the moral of the story is simple. Don't put your money on psychics, whatever the species. Psychic animals are being picked up a lot to actually give predictions, especially every time a big uh, football competition comes around, it's like the World Cup. You suddenly get this huge crop of animals appearing. They're often in zoos or little zoos, and you get the feeling that perhaps the zookeepers trying to get some attention for their, uh, their venue. You've had alpacas, you've had psychic seals, you've had lions, you've had pandas, you've had alligators and crocodiles, and of course the the original great one was Paul the octopus. That really started off the trend. (laughs) He probably kicked off the whole phenomenon. But really, when you look at it, they're not very good. I mean, as often as not, they have a choice of two. Is there going to be two flags put in front of an animal and say, which one are you going to choose? And they'll choose one out of two, which should mean they'll get 50% correct just by pure chance. But often they don't. They often get less. Some people say, oh, they did really well. They got 11 out of 24, you say, well, that's not good. <laughs> that's actually less than chance. The sad thing about the original example of this was Paul the Octopus, who, when he started failing, they ate him. Calamari. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, uh, therefore, there's not a lot of future in psychic animals in more ways than one. Not the job of choice, one would think. No. Well, people do it too. There was the Canadian Anthony Carr. Yeah, Anthony Carr claimed himself as you know, the, the modern day Nostradamus, which is not a good definition because Nostradamus was terrible as well, apart from the fact he was always being misinterpreted and he was ultra vague and all sorts of things. But he has a record. He said he predicted the 9-11, which is a bit of a long bow to draw. He actually predicted that he saw a cataclysmic 
cosmic event and warned that people should watch for a sign in the heavens because what was coming would shock the whole world and put the fear of God in us. Now, all that seems to imply something sort of supernatural and religious phenomenon, etc. Well, cosmic's the key word there, isn't it? And Yes, yeah. And then he said, well, see, after the fact, he, he then took that and said, see, I was predicting 9-11. No, you weren't. You're predicting something else. So, yeah, I'm uh, taking predict- that to mean a comet impact or an asteroid or something like that. Yeah, yeah exactly. So he, he wasn't very good. That's Tim Mindham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash space time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. The holidays start here at Baker's with a variety of options to celebrate traditions old and new. Whether you're making a traditional roasted turkey or spicy turkey tacos, your go-to shrimp cocktail, or your first Cajun risotto, Baker's has all the freshest ingredients to embrace your traditions. Baker's, fresh for everyone. We've locked in low prices to help you save big store-wide. Look for the locked in low prices tags and enjoy extra savings throughout the store. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Start Battery Month at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Get up to a $25 gift card after rebate with the purchase of select Superstar batteries. Our professional parts people will test your old battery for free and recommend the right battery for your vehicle. For power, performance, and reliability, choose Superstar batteries only at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts.